Today's chapter of The Secret Garden is chapter 11, entitled, The Nest of the Missile Thrush. For two or three minutes, he stood looking round him while Mary watched him, and then he began to walk about softly, even more lightly than Mary had walked the first time she had found herself inside the four walls. His eyes seemed to be taking in everything, the gray trees with the gray creepers climbing over them and hanging from their branches, the tangle on the walls and among the grass, the evergreen alcoves with the stone seats and tall flower urns standing in them. I never thought I'd see this place, he said at last in a whisper. Did you know about it? asked Mary. She had spoken aloud and he made a sign to her. We must talk low, he said, or someone will hear us and wonder what to do in here. Oh, I forgot, said Mary, feeling frightened and putting her hand quickly against her mouth. Did you know about the garden? She asked again when she had recovered herself. Dickon nodded. Martha told me there was one as no one ever went inside, he answered. Us used to wonder what it was like. He stopped and looked round at the lovely gray tangle about him, and his round eyes looked queerly happy. Ugh, the nest that'll be coming here in springtime, he said. It'd be the safest nest in place in England. No one never come in near and tangles of trees and roses to build in. I wonder all the birds on the moor don't build here. Mistress Mary put her hand on his arm again without knowing it. Will there be roses? She whispered. Can you tell? I thought perhaps they were all dead. Ugh, no, not them, not all of them, he answered. Look here. He stepped over to the nearest tree, an old, old one with gray lichen all over its bark, but upholding a curtain of tangled sprays and branches. He took a thick knife out of his pocket and opened one of its blades. There's lots of dead wood ought to be cut out, he said, and there's lots of old wood, but it made some new last year. This here's a new bit, and he touched a shoot which looked brownish green instead of hard, dry gray. Mary touched it herself in an eager, reverent way. That one, she said, is that one quite alive, quite? Dickon curved his wide, smiling mouth. It's as wick as you or me, he said. And Mary remembered that Martha had told her that wick meant alive or lively. I'm glad it's wick, she cried out in her whisper. I want them all to be wick. Let us go round the garden and count how many wick ones there are. She quite panted with eagerness, and Dickon was as eager as she was. They went from tree to tree and from bush to bush. Dickon carried his knife in his hand and showed her things which she thought wonderful. They've run wild, he said, but the strongest ones has fair thrived on it. The delicatest ones have died out, but the others have growed and growed and spread and spread till they's a wonder. See here, and he pulled down a thick, gray, dry-looking branch. A body might think this was dead wood, but I don't believe it is. Down to the root, I'll cut it low down and see. He knelt and with his knife cut the lifeless looking branch through, not far above the earth. There, he said exultantly, I told thee so. There's green in that wood yet, look at it. Mary was down on her knees before he spoke, gazing with all her might. When it looks a bit greenish and juicy like that, it's wick, he explained. When the inside's and dry and breaks easy, like this here piece I've cut off, it's done for. There's a big root here as all the live wood sprung out of, and if the old wood's cut off and it's dug round and took care of, there'll be... He stopped and lifted his face to look up at the climbing and hanging sprays above him. There'll be a fountain of roses here this summer. They went from bush to bush and from tree to tree. He was very strong and clever with his knife and knew how to cut the dry and dead wood away and could tell when the unpromising bough or twig had still green life in it. In the course of half an hour, Mary thought she could tell too. And when he cut through a lifeless looking branch, she would cry out joyfully under her breath when she caught sight of the least shade of moist green. The spade and the hoe and the fork were very useful. He showed her how to use the fork while he dug about the roots with the spade and stirred the earth and let the air in. They were working industriously round one of the biggest standard roses when he caught sight of something which made him utter an exclamation of surprise. Why, he cried, pointing to the grass a few feet away, who did that there? It was one of Mary's own little clearings round the pale green points. I did it, said Mary. Why, I thought they didn't know anything about gardening, he exclaimed. I don't, she answered, but they were so little and the grass was so thick and strong and they looked as if they had no room to breathe. So I made a place for them. I don't even know what they are. Dickon went and knelt down by them, smiling his wide smile. 
I don't, she answered, but they were so little and the grass was so thick and strong and they looked as if they had no room to breathe. So I made a place for them. I don't even know what they are. Dickon went and knelt down by them, smiling his wide smile. That was right, he said. A gardener couldn't have told thee better. They'll grow now like Jack's beanstalk. They're crocuses and snowdrops, and these here is narcissuses. Turning to another patch, and here is Daffy Down Dillies. Ugh, they will be a sight. He ran from one clearing to another. That's done a lot of work for such a little wench, he said, looking her over. I'm growing fatter, she said, and I'm growing stronger. I used to always be tired. When I dig, I'm not tired at all. I like to smell the earth when it's turned up. It's rare good for thee, he said, nodding his head wisely. There's not as nice as the smell of good, clean earth, except the smell of fresh growing things when the rain falls on them. I get out on the moor many a day when it's raining, and I lie under a bush and listen to the soft swish of drops on the heather, and I just sniff and sniff. My nose end fair quivers like a rabbit's, mother says. Do you never catch cold, inquired Mary, gazing at him. She had never seen such a funny boy or such a nice one. Not me, he said, grinning. I never catch cold since I was born. I wasn't brought up nesh enough. I've chased about the moor in all weather, same as the rabbits does. Mother says I've sniffed up too much fresh air for 12 years to ever get to sniffing with cold. I'm as tough as a white thorn knobstick. He was working all the time he was talking and Mary was following him and helping him with her fork or the trowel. There's a lot of work to do here, he said once, looking about quite exultantly. Will you come again and help me do it? Mary begged. I'm sure I can help too. I can dig and pull up weeds and do whatever you tell me. Oh, do come, Dickon. I'll come every day if the wants me rain or shine, he said, answered stoutly. It's the best fun I ever had in my life, shut in here and waking up a garden. If you will come, said Mary, if you will help me to make it alive, I'll, I don't know what I'll do, she ended helplessly. What could you do for a boy like that? I'll tell thee what they'll do, said Dickon with his happy grin. They'll get fat and they'll get as hungry as a young fox and they'll learn how to talk to the robin same as I do. Oh, we'll have a lot of fun. He began to walk about looking up in the trees and at the walls and bushes with a thoughtful expression. I wouldn't want to make it look like a gardener's garden, all clipped and spick and span, would you? He said. It's nicer like this with things running wild and swinging and catching hold of each other. Don't let us make it tidy, said Mary anxiously. It wouldn't seem like a secret garden if it was tidy. Dickon stood rubbing his rusty red head with a rather puzzled look. It's a secret garden, sure enough, he said. But seems like someone besides the robin must have been in it since it was shut up ten years ago. But the door was locked and the key was buried, said Mary. No one could get in. That's true, he answered. It's a queer place. Seems to me as if there'd been a bit of pruning done here and there later than ten year ago. But how could it have been done, said Mary. He was examining a branch of a standard rose and he shook his head. Aye, how could it, he murmured, with the door locked and the key buried. Mistress Mary always felt that however many years she lived, she should never forget that first morning when her garden began to grow. Of course, it did seem to begin to grow for her that morning. When Dickon began to clear places to plant seeds, she remembered what Basil had sung to her when he wanted to tease her. Are there any flowers that look like bells, she inquired. Lilies of the Valley does, he answered, digging away with the trowel. And there's Canterbury bells and Campanulas. Let's plant some, said Mary. There's Lily of the Valley here already, I saw them. They all have grown too close and we'll have to separate them, but there's plenty. The other ones take two years to bloom from seed, but I can bring you some bits of plants from our cottage garden. Why does the want them? Then Mary told about Basil and his brothers and sisters in India and how, how she hated them and of them calling her Mistress Mary quite contrary. They used to dance around me and sing. They sang, Mistress Mary, quite contrary, how does your garden grow? With silver bells and cockle shells and marigolds all in a row. I just remembered it and it made me wonder if there were really flowers like silver bells. She frowned a little and gave her trowel a rather spiteful dig into the earth. I wasn't as contrary as they were. But Dickon laughed. Eh, he said, and he crumbled up the rich black soil he saw. He was sniffing up the scent of it. There doesn't seem to be no need for one to be contrary when there's flowers and such like, and such a lot of friendly wild things running about making homes for themselves or building nests and singing and whistling, does there? Mary, kneeling by him holding the seeds, looked at him and stopped frowning. Dickon, she said. You are as nice as Martha said you were. I like you, and you make the fifth person. I never thought I should like five people. 
Dickon sat up on his heels as Martha did when she was polishing the grate. He did look funny and delightful, Mary thought, with his round blue eyes and red cheeks and happy-looking turned-up nose. Only five folks is the likes, he said. Who is the other four? Your mother and Martha, Mary checked them off on her fingers, and the Robin and Ben Weatherstaff. Dickon laughed so that he was obliged to stifle the sound by putting his arm over his mouth. I know the thinks I'm queer, lad, he said, but I think they're the queerest little ass I ever saw. Then Mary did a strange thing. She leaned forward and asked him a question she had never dreamed of asking anyone before. And she tried to ask it in Yorkshire because that was his language. And in India, a native was always pleased if you knew his speech. Does like me, she said. Ah, he answered heartily. That I does. I likes thee wonderful and so does the robin, I do believe. That's two then, said Mary. That's two for me. And then they began to work harder than ever and more joyfully. Mary was startled and sorry when she heard the big clock in the courtyard strike the hour of her midday dinner. I shall have to go, she said mournfully, and you will have to go too, won't you? Dickon grinned. My dinner's easy to carry about with me, he said. Mother always lets me put a bit of something in my pocket. He picked up his coat from the grass and brought out a pocket of lumpy little bundle tied up in a clean white coarse blue and white handkerchief. It held two thick pieces of bread with a slice of something laid between them. It's often it's not but bread, he said, but I've got a fine slice of fat bacon with it today. Mary thought it looked a queer dinner, but he seemed ready to enjoy it. Run on and get thy victuals, he said. I'll be done with mine first, and I'll get some more work done before I start back home. He sat down with his back against a tree. I'll call the robin up, he said, and give him the rind of the bacon to peck at. They likes a bit of fat wonderful. Mary could scarcely bear to leave him. Suddenly it seemed as if he might be a sort of wood fairy who might be gone when she came into the garden again. He seemed too good to be true. She went slowly halfway to the door in the wall and then she stopped and went back. Whatever happens, you you never would tell, she said. His poppy-colored cheeks were distended with his first big bite of bread and bacon, but he managed to smile encouragingly. If thou was a missile thrush and showed me where thy nest was, does that think I'd tell anyone? Not me, he said. Thou art as safe as a missile thrush. And she was quite sure she was. See you tomorrow for chapter 12. Have a good day. Bye.